We're looking at several passages of scripture. I'm so glad a couple of you can remind me of them. Uh, last night, last night at, during Bible study, I just said, wow, that actually hurt me to read the entire chapters of Paul in uh, Romans chapters 15 and 16. And then with be sure that you read 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, just so you'll be sure that you understand or have an appreciation for how these passages of scripture, how these people in scripture uh, come together. Uh, in Romans chapter 15, verses 25 through 33, uh, it called, uh talks about the Gentiles ministry to the Jews where he and his associates had received this special offering from the Gentile churches in Greece for the suffering Jewish saints in Jerusalem. You get the details about this offering, this collection over in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And I told you on the first day I mentioned that to you that there are several purposes behind this special offering. To begin with, it was an expression of love on the part of the Gentiles toward their Jewish brethren. Second, it meant practical relief at a time when the poor Jewish believers needed it the most. Third, it helped to unite Jews and Gentiles in the church. It was a bond that brought them together, closer together. Did you know that giving can do that? Yes, it can. Paul looked on this offering as the paying of a debt. The Gentiles had received spiritual wealth from, from the Jews, and they now returned material wealth, paying their debt. Not only was this offering a payment of a debt, but it was also fruit, Romans 15, 28. It was not loot, I told you. It was not a stash. It was not drug money that Paul had gotten from the churches and collected from the people. It was fruit, the natural result of their walk with the Lord. When the life of the spirit flows through a church, giving is no problem. When the life of the spirit flows through the Christian, it opens our heart, which opens our hand. And so we're going to look today at, as Paul in 2 Corinthians chapters 8, particularly in verses 1 through 5, how he describes the miracle of grace that occurred in the churches of Macedonia. You ready to move on forward, aren't you? One of the major ministries of Paul's third missionary journey was this taking up of a special relief offering. It was for the poor Christians in Judea. It was for the mother church, the Jerusalem church. Once before Paul had assisted in this way, if you read about it in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, and you know... He was happy, happy, happy to do it again. It is significant that it was Paul who remembered the forgotten be attitude of our Lord. Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I always, when I see that verse of scripture, I always think about how we see it in the red letter editions of our Bibles, even though we only give Jesus speaking rights in the Gospels where it's in the red. But Paul had other blessings in mind besides the material assisting of the poor. He wanted this offering to strengthen the unity of the church as the Gentile churches shared with the Jewish congregations across the sea, yes, and I told you, read Romans chapter 15, verses 25 through 28 again. 
You see, this offering was also evidence to the Jewish believers, some of whom were still zealous for the law, that Paul was not the enemy of the Jews or of Moses. Look like it. But try reading Acts chapter 20, verse 17. That early in his ministry, Paul had promised Galatians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. He had promised to remember the poor. And he labored to keep that promise. But at the same time, he hoped that the generosity, write that word down somewhere, generosity. Sometimes people think that they are giving a sacrificial offering when in fact, it just might be a tip so less than the tithe. Paul hoped that the generosity of the Gentiles would silence the jealousy of the Jews, unfortunately. Ooh, those people in Corinth, the Corinthians, they were not doing their part. Oh, like so many people, not you. Like so many people, not us. They had made promises, those Corinthians. They had made promises, but they failed to keep them, not us. In fact, an entire year had been wasted. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. You remember reading that, don't you? Because that was part of the homework reading assignment. Started Monday, didn't it? And carried over to Tuesday, didn't it? Here we are. What was the cause of this serious delay? The low spiritual level of the church members. I'm going to tell you again. When a church is not spiritual, they will not be generous. That your generosity is inextricably tied to your spirituality. Another factor why the Corinthians had just shut down, reneged was the invasion, the influence of the Judaizers who they were probably siphoning off as much money as they could. You don't get to see that until the latter chapters of 2 Corinthians, like chapters 11 and 12. Paul knew that it would be difficult to get Christians in Corinth to participate. So you know what he did? He lifted his appeal to give in this offering like you promised. He lifted his appeal to the highest spiritual level possible. How did he do that? He taught them. He taught them. He taught them that giving was an act of grace. Y'all heard that before, haven't you? Good old grace giving. That's how Paul got them back on track. Paul used nine different words to refer to the offering. But the one he used the most was grace. That giving is truly a ministry and fellowship. 2 Corinthians 8 and 4 that helps others, but the motivation must be from the grace of God in the heart, that when you are a beneficiary of God's grace, then you must be a benefactor of God's grace and pass it on. Paul knew that this collection was a debt owed by the Gentiles, Romans 15, 27. You see why you want to read these together? Paul knew that this collection was a debt 
owed by the Gentiles and fruit from their Christian lives. Romans 15, 28. But it was even more. It was the working of the grace of God in human hearts. Oh, wake up, wake up, wake up. It is a wonderful thing, children of God, when Christians enter into the grace of giving. No more tithing. Ah, uh, so you know it's not going to be less than the tithe. Grace, giving. Giving as God has graced you. When you see that this giving I'm talking about is grace giving, how do I know if it's grace giving? Number one, you can know that it's grace giving. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verses one and two. When we give in spite of circumstances. How can I know that it's grace giving? It's when we, secondly, second Corinthians chapter eight, verses three and four. Give enthusiastically. I know that I am engaged in grace giving when I give in spite of my circumstances. I know that I'm engaged in grace giving when I give enthusiastically. Thirdly, I know that I am grace giving. Verses five through nine. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, when I give as Jesus gave. And then finally, I know that my grace giving is grace giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, when my giving sacrificially, Willingly, verses 10 through 12. There is a great difference between making the pledge or the promise and the performance of that pledge or promise. But I know that I am giving, grace giving, Verses 13 through 24, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. When I give by faith. Oh, beloved, I don't know where you live. I don't know where you've been scattered from the building. But you will walk taller wherever you are. When you come to that place of understanding that grace giving is a matter of faith. We obey God and believe that he will meet our needs as we help to meet the needs of others. I'll tell you what. Beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16. I'm not going to do that. I am going to take you back and put some meat on those bones. But i like to let you look for things. And you'll see that beginning right there. How do I know what section goes with what section? How do I know what passage of the scripture? You got to read. And you'll see in verse 16 or at least beginning there, where Paul makes this sudden turn. He makes this sudden turn from a profound spiritual principle. That's why you're going to get to chapter 9. Is because from verse 16 forward, he moves from a profound spiritual principle to some practical counsel on how the special collection would be handled. While it's true that grace giving means given by faith, it is also true that grace giving does not mean giving by chance. 
that you and I, the Christian who shares with others, must be sure that what we give is managed honestly and faithfully. Over the years, I love to teach stewardship. I kid you not, those that have gone through steps one and step two, you know when I get to step two, I am a new creature. That all things of giving donations, all things are, are given a pledge, all things are passed away of just just uh, giving in the offering, all things are passed away. And all things are become new. I've tried to encourage God's people to support ministries that could be trusted. And on more than one occasion, I've warned church members not to give to those unworthy organizations only to discover that that's who they believe. That's who they give to. And they'll ask me questions like, well, if I'm giving to the, and if I'm giving to my, and if I'm giving to my, only to discover they'll come to me not very long thereafter and say, I sent a check to that outfit, and now I discovered that it's a fake, that they phonies. I warned you not to give anything. I didn't say, see that I told you. And they'll answer me back. Well, the Lord laid it on my heart. <laughs> Even though the money was wasted, I, I'll get credit for it in, in, in heaven. Listen, grace giving is not foolish giving. Even in a local church, the people who handle the funds have to possess certain qualifications. I teach it like that because I know it like that. I don't care if you're the Sunday school teacher collecting the Sunday school money. Ought to be some qualifications that you got to pass. Paul was very careful how he handled money entrusted to him because he did not want to get the reputation of being a religious rogue. He did not want that to be the testimony of the people that he was a thief. The churches that contributed to the collection chose certain representatives to travel with Paul so that everything would be done honestly, decently. And in order, y'all, 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 y'all just bear, bear, bear truth, bear witness to that. You've heard that thing. As long as it's done decently and in order, and then they're followed by that. Amen. It's a wonderful thing when Christians enter into the grace of giving, when they really believe that giving is more blessed than receiving. How can we tell when we are practicing grace giving? Paul gave us about five evidences that appear when our giving is motivated by grace. Let's look at the first one I gave you. When we give in spite of circumstances. The Macedonian churches that Paul was using as an example here, they had experienced severe difficulties. And yet, they had given generously. They had not simply gone through affliction. Second Corinthians. Chapter 8, verse 2 says that they had experienced a great trial of affliction. That they were in deep poverty, which means they had, the bottom had fallen out. That they were at a point of rock bottom destitution. They just 
they just, as we would say in our culture, I can't afford it. I don't have it. I'm busted. See, the word that Paul uses here describes a beggar who has absolutely nothing and has no hope of getting anything. Word study, word study, syntax, syntax, context, context. You hear what I'm saying? Their difficult situation may have been caused in part by their Christian faith. For they may have lost their jobs or been excluded from the trade guilds because they refused to have anything to do with idolatry. Culture, culture, culture. But their circumstances did not hinder them from giving. In fact, when you read chapters eight and nine again this time, in observation, you'll see that they gave joyfully and deliberately and sacrificially. They didn't have no uh, calculator counting up what they did. They didn't have no ad machine. You know why? Because no calculator and no ad machine and no computer could analyze this amazing formula that you see written here. Great affliction and deep poverty plus grace equals abundant joy and abounding liberality. I, 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 I'm going to get Doc Jenny to help me write out this formula because I see it. I can envision it. Because this formula reminds us of the paradox in Paul's ministry. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 10. He says, as poor, yet making many rich. It also reminds us of the generous offerings that were taken at the building of the tabernacle back there in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. And also the offering that was taken uh, uh, for the temple in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 6 through 9. It's called correlation. In observation, in interpretation, there's correlation. Listen, when we have experienced the grace of God in our lives, no, let me do it like I do it. Let me put it in that, uh, is that second person? One of them persons. When you have experienced the grace of God in your life. You will not use difficult circumstances as a reason or an excuse for not giving. My cousin, the late uh, Deacon John Allen Green, used to always say, uh, Bernard, you make an excuse, an excuse. He was an older, wiser man. He says an excuse is nothing but a crutch for failure. The late Dr. E. K. Bailey, my mentor. Oh, how I can't talk, I can't teach, I can't preach without him in my head. He used to say to us that. An excuse is nothing but the skin of an onion that needs to be shed. Paul helps the Corinthians and the Bible Basians 
all the other churches who will read this letter to understand that when you have experienced the grace of God in your life, you will not use difficult circumstances as an excuse for not giving for that matter. Reverend Paul, Best Mason, are circumstances ever an encouragement to giving? Well, in my first pastorate, we had a great need for getting out of the house, getting out of the strip mall, getting out of the hotel. We had a great need for a church campus site. And it was, I'm telling you, these were wealthier kind of people than I know now, but they were stingy. And beloved, you can't be spiritual, write this down, and stingy at the same time. They were new to, some of them, too many of them were new to the faith or new to church life, Bible-based fellowship, church style. And so many of them were stingy, opposed to a building program because of the, they would say, the economic conditions. They would keep up with uh, uh, business today and USA Today. They would read the uh, what the steel mills are planning to do, what the airlines are planning to do to go on strike. And they would read and see what the refineries was going to do and what the railroads, they, I mean, they were smart, but they were stingy. So they weren't spiritual. And they would say, Pastor, this seems to be too risky at this time. Oh, but having gone through steps one and two, and when they got under me under step two, before they ever get to somebody's Sunday school class, yes, there were enough people who believed in grace giving so that the church that you see when you go down Ehrlich Road, when you, the campus that you see when you go down Ehrlich Road, the traffic that you see was birthed out of faith in spite of the strikes, faith in spite of the shutdowns, faith in spite of what USA Today said, faith, in spite of the layoffs, in spite of the economic conditions. And so I take us to prayer by reminding you that grace giving means giving in spite of circumstances. We'll put a pin there and we'll move on to verses three and four next time we're together. And you'll understand that you know it's grace giving. Not only when you give in spite of circumstances, but when you give enthusiastically. Father in heaven, oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this hour. Thank you, Lord, for those in other time zones, even now. Thank you for those, oh God, who regardless of the time zone, they rise to dial in to our devotion time we call morning manna. Thank you 
for the long arm of your word, how it reaches to places I've never been, how it reaches people I've never seen, how it reaches people who want to hear from you. How it reaches people where lives are being changed and souls are being won and destinies are being altered as we proclaim your great name. And so Lord, today in all the earth, May your name be hallowed. Your kingdom realized. Your will done, Lord. We pray for our students. We pray for the teachers, Lord. We pray for their safety. We pray for their mental state. We pray for their mental health. We pray, oh God, that you keep your hand upon them each day. Lord, for every parent, every household, oh God, meet the needs cause us to be free of stinginess, cause us to be free of selfishness, cause us to be free of stubbornness, cause us to realize the value of our being spiritual, trusting in you with all our hearts and not leaning to our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledging you, assured that you shall direct our paths. Lord, as we go about this day again, again and again, would you move on our hearts to first seek your kingdom and your righteousness assured that all these things we think are so necessary important desire will be added unto us thank you for that healing thank you for that testimony lord thank you for time that that even when we are sick seems like it's so long takes so long, lasts so long. Lord, we pray for those who are in jail or in any place of incarceration. We pray your hand be upon them, keep them safe. We pray that your spirit be upon them, keep their minds. And while you have their attention, Lord, make them know that thou art God and beside you there is no other and cause them, O oh God, to look to you. Oh yes, Lord, they'll decide on a testimony and a plea and they'll decide on a on a uh, an attorney and counsel make us oh god decide to recognize you in your place in your power and for each person connected on this call unite us in faith, unite us in learning to give in spite of circumstances. To give, oh God, 
enthusiastically. Thank you for feeding the birds and taking care of the lilies of the field. Thank you for how you array them in their beauty. No less for us, we know you will. We're yours. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, y'all, that's uh, another one of those good old mornings of OT. I'll take you a little faster. Um, read again 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, especially, and then verse 5 through 9, especially, and the Lord says the same, we'll get as far as verses 10 through 12, especially. We'll see more about grace giving tomorrow. Bye-bye.